Okay, shall we start? Yeah, yeah, wait, uh, I was like managing the participants and then starting the record and then I will introduce you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, wait, I have to like... <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for, for joining for the second talk of the SoloTube. <laughs> and today we are very happy to have Li Li from the Institute of Theoretical Physics and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, uh, Lili has been doing very interesting work in, in, in applied holography to condensed matter and with fermions, with uh, competing orders, very interesting things. He was in Crete, he was in Lehigh in the US, that I remember, he's probably in more places. So it's very, very nice to have him. And uh, he will tell, tell us about intertwin orders and fermionic uh, spectral functions in holography. So please, Lee, go ahead whenever you want. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks for the invitation. So I'm very glad to give a talk in this special way. Actually, this is my first time to give an online talk. So today I would like to show some results about the black hole with intertwined orders and the fermions by using holographic duality. So this talk is based on our recent works with my collaborators. So here, Oh, sorry. It's about, uh, something wrong. Okay, okay. So here is the upper line. So in the first part, I will give a basic introduction to the background. So Yang has given a very nice talk on Wednesday, in particular, from the condensed matter point of view. Here, I will pay more attention to the gravity side. In the second part, I will talk about our holographic setup. First, I will show the spatially modulated black hole with the intertwined orders. Then, in the second part, is the formula response in the striped faces. Okay, just before the, this talk, I noticed that Sarah will talk about the formulas in true. So I think I should only brief show the main result and leave more details in Sarah's talk. The last one is the conclusion. Okay, so the black hole should be the most exotic objects predicted by general relativity. So its gravity is so strong, even the light cannot escape from it. So it looks quite dark. It has a boundary called event horizon. So with the progress of science and the technology, we're now able to see the picture of the black hole from the event horizon telescope and to listen the gravitational waves from the two black hole margin, in particular from LIGO work collaboration. This confirms that black holes is, are indeed real objects in our universe. But however, if we consider quantum effects, we will find that black holes are not, are not completely black. It will lose energy and evaporate by Hawking radiation. It also have a finite temperature and entropy. Most surprisingly, we find that the black hole entropy is given by the aerial law, not the volume law. More precisely, the entropy is proportional to the area of its event horizon divided by the Planck area. For a stellar mass black hole, it's a huge number. So the black hole thermodynamics, and in particular, the area law of the entropy indicate a very deep and a fundamental relationship between gravitation, thermodynamics, and quantum theory. So far, to unify the general relativity and the quantum mechanism is still one of the biggest challenges of the modern physics. So we want a theory for quantum gravity to understand the nature of the gravity, the nature of the space-time, and the nature of our universe. Motivated by this aerial law, so a holo the holographic principle was proposed for quantum gravity. Roughly speaking, the description of the volume of space can be thought 
as encoded on a lower dimensional boundary to the region. There is a cartoon to understand this point. Here, all information of the three dimensional world can be projected onto the boundary surface. However, so how the degrees of freedom can be described by the boundary theory is still an open problem. The first realization of the holographic principle was proposed by Madsena in 1997. The duality comes from the low energy limit of string theory. It tells us that gauge theory or quantum field theory is somehow equivalent to a gravitational theory in one higher dimension. We call it holographic because two theories live in different dim dimensions. The quantum field theory is in d dimension space time, while the gravitational theory is in d plus one dimensional space time. It's just like a hologram. Okay, so the basic example is as follows. A theory of gravity in d plus one dimensional anti theta space is a conformal field theory in d space time dimensions. We mean that observables are in one to one correspondence. Anti theta space can be viewed as a collection of copies of Minkowski space with a different size labeled by the parameter small r. Here is a cartoon. So the left side is a series of spin transformation labeled by a parameter r. The right part is the anti theta space, which organizes the field information in the same way. So the excitations with different wavelengths will get put in different places in the back picture. So the duality gives a geometric realization of the RG flow. The evolution of the geometry along this radial direction represents the RG flow of the dual field theory. Actually, one of the most interesting and useful feature is the weak strong correspondence. That's to say, when the QFT side is at a strong coupling, the dual theory of gravitation is weakly coupled and vice versa. So the duality gives us a framework to deal with strongly coupled systems. Remarkable progress has been made in applying this correspondence to nuclear physics, condensed matter, quantum information, and so on. So that's we are here. And uh, in today's talk, I mainly focus on the condensed matter application. So, okay, there are many challenges for strongly coupled quantum phases of matter. For example, the breakdown of a Fermi liquid theory. So we are dealing with quantum matter without quasi particles. They are very complicated phase diagrams with a variety of orders. There are segmented Fermi surfaces like Fermi arcs. There are also anomalous transport like strand metal, bed metal, Planck dissipation, long range entanglement. So in today's talk, we focus on these two aspects. Okay, our strategy is to study solvable models that might be in the same universality class and strongly coupled systems. So our goal is to have useful lessons or universal features, shed light on basic mechanism underlying the dynamics. So we stress that solvable often implies working with simplified toy models. We hope that the simple toy model could uh, capture the key features of the system. Okay, so any questions? Oh, I see. Okay, so let's move to the second part. What we want is to construct stationary black hole solutions where spatial translation symmetry is broken, in particular spontaneously. Our motivation are twofold. On the one hand, stationary solutions of the Einstein equations, especially black holes, are the most fundamental of all gravitational objects. 
So the search for new stationary solutions will help us to understand general relativity more broadly and deeply. On the other hand, from the holographic duality, these new world black hole solutions provide a due description of quantum phases where different orders appear to be intertwined and have comparable strengths. These spontaneous orders are believed to be important in the rich phase diagram of strongly coupled systems, for example, in high TC superconductors. Okay, there are a number of striped quantum phases that are generated spontaneously in strongly correlated systems. A typical example is the pair density wave. In PTW, the superconducting condensate is specially modulated, but its spatial value is zero. The condensate looks like this cosine, and the delta Q is the amplitude for the modulation. Meanwhile, the charge density oscillates twice the frequency of the condensate. You see rho zero is a uniform component and rho two Q is the amplitude for the modulation. This is nothing but the charge density wave induced by the condensate. In contrast, in the coexisting superconducting and the CDW phase, we call SC plus CDW, the condensate has a non-zero uniform component, delta zero here, and the CDW oscillates at the same frequency as the condensate. They have the same wave number, capital Q. Okay, let's show our holographic theory. So here is the back model coupled with meta field. Here, chi and theta are two scalars. A mu is the U1 gauge field which corresponds to the charge density of the field theory. Here, to break the U1 symmetry spontaneously, we introduce the Zuckerberg term, which also known as Josephson action in condensed matter. It allows for more general couplings to describe a holographic superconductor seen in the literatures. And this term is crucial for the spatially modulated instabilities Okay, actually we want a bell curve in the right part, the blue curve, which has a peak at a finite wave number. Without this term, the leading unstable mode is not striped. Okay, here we show the broken phase. Let's focus on the striped phase. We mean the translation symmetry is broken in one special direction X. Here we have nine functions for the coupled PDEs, which depends on the radio coordinate Z and one special coordinate X. In order for the broken phase to appear spontaneously, we turn off all source terms and fix the boundary to be ADS. You see here, all source terms for Psi, AY, U5, U6 are zero, and we turn on a homogeneous chemical potential, mu, so let's skip all details. I only emphasize that all physical quantities can be found from the boundary data and Z is equal to zero. So here, O is the condensate, rho is the charge density, and JY is the current density. So here we show the full solution by solving the system numerically. Here U1 is the TD component you see from the metric and the U3 is the XX component. Psi is the scalar and phi is the U1 gauge potential. The black hole boundary is at Z equals to zero and the horizon is at Z equals to one in this coordinate system. As you can see, the striped deformation is strong near the horizon and will decrease as we move to the ADS boundary. That means the striped deformation is relevant in the IR. Uh, actually, from the gravity point of view, this solution is a new black hole with a scalar charge and the current hairs. So a natural question appears. 
is this black hole solution thermodynamically stable or not? So the answer is yes. So let's see the free energy as a function of temperature. Here, the red curve is for the broken phase and the, dotted, the dashed blue curve is for the normal phase, the rest of the strong black hole. It's clear that the broken phase has a lower free energy than the normal phase. So it is thermodynamically stable. Actually near the critical temperature TC, there is a second order phase transition. Okay, here we show the condensate, the current density and the charge density along the X direction. Here, different colors correspond to different temperatures. This modulation increases as the temperature is lowered. So we can find some interesting features. So you, as you can see, the superconducting condensate is specially modulated, but the special average is vanishing, no uniform component. And the charge density oscillates at twice the frequency of the current and the condensate. And the current density wave and the charge density uh, condensate modulation are precisely out of phase. You see the condensate have nodes where the current density and the charge density are maximal. So this is precisely what is meant with a pair density wave, a superconducting state that does break translations even without a magnetic field. Okay, now let's move to study the dynamics of the striped phase by considering the optical conductivity. So note that the conductivity matrix is given like this capital G is the electric current, capital E is the electric field. As we know, the computation can be mapped to gravity side by solving the perturbation equations. So this is the formula. Here, AY and AX are the Y and X components of the U1 gauge field. And from the ADS boundary, we can find the source and the response. In particular, we should impose ingoing boundary condition near the black hole horizon. That means this animal will jump into the black hole. So this corresponds to the retarded two-point gray function. Here, as we know, the DC conductivity should be divergent due to the Goldstone mode from the spontaneous translation a uh, translation symmetry breaking. So in order to distinguish the divergence of the conductivity due to superconducting excitation from the one due to spontaneously translation symmetry breaking, we introduce an explicit ionic lattice via the modulation of chemical potential mu with the amplitude capital A so what we are considering is the spontaneous crystallization in the presence of a background lattice. Okay, here is the conductivity that is orthogonal to the stripes. You see, the red curve is the imaginary part for the conductivity and the blue curve is for the real part. You see there is a Okay, I got it. there is a pole in the red curve. That means the DC conductivity is divergent. So the broken phase indeed describes a superconducting state. There is also a finite peak here uh, at finite frequency. This might be due to phonon mode or pinning effect because we have an ionic lattice here. Very interesting, we find that our numerical data can be fit quite well by this Lorenzo formula. Here we add a pole to describe the superconducting feature. In this plot, we use two Lorenz modes to fit the data. The Lorenz modes are typically used to describe the pinny for the CDW in condensed matter size. 
Okay, so far we focus on the striped solution, the unidirectional striped solution. Actually, our discussion can be generalized to the fully crystallized case where the translation symmetry can be broken in all spatial directions. Here we show the density plot for the condensate. Here and the charge density. Here the bright region corresponds to the positive values and the dark region to the negative values. As you can see, oh, here, the, arrow, the, the arrows denote the spontaneous currents. We have these loop currents because we have a parity breaking. Note that we introduced a parity breaking term, the transcendence like term in the theory. We find that the rules of striped order repeat themselves in this fully crystal case. And the chart order is now surrounded by the spontaneous current patterns that is similar to the D-density wave of condensed matter physics. So to sum up, so we have a holographic description for the pair density wave. I mean the holographic quantum phase intertwined the superconducting order with the charge density wave, parity order and the current density wave given a music of a quantum matter. And more recently, the numerical, uh, the exp experimental evidence for the PDW can be found in this interesting work. Okay, so let's introduce our second model without the parity breaking. So here we have two U1 gauge field, but with a different physical interpretation, we are A mu, correspond to the charge density of the field theory, and B mu is the spectator field, which might due to spin density or a second species for the charge carriers. We also incorporate the Stubaker term to describe the U1 symmetry breaking. Now, this term is crucial for the spatially modulated instabilities. Without this term, the leading unstable mode is not striped. Like this blue curve, you see the peak is at a zero wave number. So the thermodynamical stable phase should be homogeneous, not striped. Actually, we find that different quantum phases can be described in this model, depends on two charts, QA and QB, here is the order parameters for different quantum phases. You see delta zero is the uniform component for the superconducting condensate. Delta Q is the amplitude for the mode with the wave number Q and the rho is the charge density. Depends on QA and QB. In our holographic theory, we can have pair density wave, charge density wave, the coexisting superconducting and the CDW phase, and the even a homogeneous superconducting phase, actually together with other model parameters, which can be fixed analytically. Note that, so translation symmetry is broken spontaneously in pair density wave, charge density wave, and the superconducting plus CDW phase. Here we show the typical result for the condensate and the charge density. We have the features we mentioned before. For example, in PDW, here see the blue curve. The condensate is a specially modulation, but uh, with a zero average. In the superconducting plus CDW phase, you see the dashed curve. We have a non-zero uniform component. Here we compare the charge density and the condensate. In this case, the period of the charge density is one half of the condensate. And in the right part, the condensate and the charge density share the same period. So they are the key features we talk about. Okay, in the second part, I will talk about the fermion response in this striped phase. 
as I mentioned, Sarah will give a talk in June. So I will just show the main result and leave more detail in Sarah's talk. Actually, there are a lot of work on fermion response in holography. In particular, the fermion spectral function can be related to the upper data in condensed matter. But the most studies focus on cases with translational invariance or homogeneous lattice. However, to make a contact with the real material, it's important to include effects of lattice. As we have, we already mentioned, they are rich striped effects in strongly correlated electron systems. There are a few holographic investigations on fermions, but some interesting features have been identified, such as anisotropic Fermi surface and the appearance of a gap at the Broyle zone boundary. So here we want to study the role of the spontaneous and uh, the explicit translation symmetry breaking on fermion spectral function. In gravity side, we just we need to solve the Dirac equation in the striped stri background. So this is the typical geometry we used to solve the system. In the spontaneous case, the striped deformation is generated spontaneously. And in the right part, we turn on an ionic lattice. So here, from the spatial modulation of the chemical potential. So to solve the system, we use a block expansion here, capital K is the on-club vector and denotes different growing zones. And the spectral function can be found from the imaginary part of the green function. And the, green, the Fermi surface can be identified from the very sharp peak at a zero frequency from the spectral function. For example, in this case, so the spectral weight is very smooth. There is no Fermi surface. And in this case, we have a very sharp peak, which gives the location of the Fermi surface. Here we show the density plot of the spectral function in the Kx and the Ky plane. So you see there is a gap below the critical temperature and this gap increases as the temperature is lowered. So if we add ionic lattice, we will find that, that the peak becomes large and they are more pronounced anisotropy. A very interesting feature is that in the symmetry breaking direction, Kx direction, you see the peaks in the spectral function are suppressed when the lattice effect are strong. That means the Fermi surface disappears leaving behind detached segments. This feature is reminiscent of Fermi arcs, in particular in high TC superconductors. Actually, we find this feature, this feature is more generic. For example, from the einstein maxwell theory, we only turn on ionic lattice from the chemical potential, you see, as the lattice effect is strong, the peak is suppressed from red curve to the blue curve in contrast in the y direction where there is no lattice effect, the spectral weight is not suppressed. Similar result happens for the einstein maxwell scalar model. Here the lattice is provided by the source of the scalar field. You see similar features. And it even happens for the CDW case. We have a purely spontaneous case, you see. This feature, the spectral weight is suppressed. So to sum up, we find that the fine structure of the Fermi surface is sensitive to the details of the theory, but the Fermi surface will be genera genera uh, gener uh, will generically suppressed when the lattice effect is strong enough. So far, the real origin of the spectral weight separation is still unclear. Recently, the authors of this paper argued that this feature might be due to a collision of the Fermi surface pole with the zeros of the green function. And in this paper, 
they claim that this is due to the anisotropic features of the horizon. Here we give another possible explanation uh, by increasing the lattice amplitude, we lift the energy band above the Fermi level due to the strong onclub and gain value repulsion. So as you see, by increasing the lattice strength, there is an energy gap opening near the zero frequency. So the spectral wet in this case will be very small given a a detector for the surface. Actually, in our previous study, we used the spectral density by, by folding the contribution from each brown zone to the first zone. This is the reduced rep re representation. Actually, there is another scheme for the spectral density without the folding. This scheme should be more relevant to APAS experimental data. Here we show the typical result for the spectral wet in this extended zoom scheme. As you see, the spectral density is not periodic in this scheme, but when the peak in each zoom are sufficiently sharp, you see the red color, the red curve, they differ from each other only by own club web vector, capital K, you see this peak and this peak and this peak. Actually, when the lattice effect is strong enough, all these peaks are suppressed, you see from the red curve to the blue curve. We stress that our main conclusion are independent of the scheme we used and suggested by Young, this non-periodicity might be a generic feature and a direct probe of the non-Fermi liquid. So it would be very interesting to test it experimentally. Here we show, we see the spectral wet in this extended zone. And here there is also and symmetry across the brown zone boundary. One side is bright, the other side is dim, like a Fermi arc or pocket. Okay, to conclusion, so we see the periodic stripes or lattice display very interesting behaviors which might be relevant to experimental observations. The own club effect can only be seen in spatially dependent background. And we showed that the disappearance of the Fermi surface seems to be a generic feature of a strongly translation symmetry breaking. There are many open questions. So what's the nature of the ground state? Can we find some interesting transport properties and the dispersion relations and we have segmented the pieces for the Fermi surface. Are they really related to Fermi arcs? Can we compare them to experiments? It's interesting to see the Fermi surface for the fully crystallized solution. And uh, what happens if we include the magnetic field? So at the present stage, the outcomes of our holographic exercise offer no more than a rough cartoon. However, the cartoon is suggestive with regard to generalities. It will, be, it will be very helpful to think about how to map the back theory to the real world system. Okay, I think I stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Thank you very much. <coughs> so we have time for questions. Okay. I don't know if... <coughs> I didn't see it, say it in the beginning, but whomever wants to ask a question, just uh, un unmute himself or herself and, and ask. <clears throat> Let's see. <clears throat> I don't see anybody asking. <laughs> Maybe I can ask you a, a small question. Maybe you said it, Lee, but um, mm -hmm. so in this, so when you have these solutions with uh, non homogeneous black holes, well, all of the, all of these solutions. <coughs> can you 
uh, maybe it's hard, but can you characterize a bit more which kind, if, if you had some scalings or not in the IR, which kind of, uh, of like dependence, temperature dependence of, of transport coefficients and things like that? Have you looked at it? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question, but for this strike the solution, it's not easy to calculate, you mean the transport, in particular at a low temperature. Mm -hmm. So, so far, we don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, I can ask a question. question. Okay. Uh, when nobody else is asking a question. Go ahead. Um, and basically about, um, that's the question of spectral weight, right? Because of uh, zone potentials. And I'm just a bit confused because, um, Sasha has been strongly arguing that it's this uh, uh, right zero eating the pole business. And I hear Lee saying that that's not, not yet clear. Uh, I would like to hear a bit of a debate. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Sorry to Sasha, I was just saying out there indeed. Um, what should I believe? Just in case. What should I believe? Uh, I can answer that question partially. There, there are many ways the spectral weight can be suppressed. Mm -hmm. The simplest way, for instance, is if uh, the, 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 the sharpness and the height of the peak in the, in the fermionic spectral function, the first approximation is determined simply by the mass over the charge ratio. In mm -hmm. an anisotropic system, the mass and the charge can actually, in the infrared, be anisotropic the effective mm -hmm. mass and the effective charge. So you can very easily suppress the spectral weight by just playing with those, those things. That's a very different mechanism than a collision of a zero with a Green's function. So that's why just seeing suppression of spectral weight, you have to actually spend some time trying to figure out what is the exact mechanism by which the spectral weight gets suppressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know, but there's at least one third type of mechanism that can suppress the spectral weight in these holographic systems. Mm -hmm. But just seeing the suppression of spectral weight is not, uh, um, is interesting, but uh, mm -hmm. there are many mechanisms by which it can occur. And you have to, uh, I mean, if you want to understand the physics of it, you have to understand what the mechanism is. Is there yeah. a way to distinguish this by, uh do experiments. I mean, the uh, 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 zero eating the pole, I find a rather uh, specific mechanism, right? And I'm not really sure how uh, generic it is. It's generic perhaps for holographic things, but it's generic for, for anything. Is there a way to uh, make these differences more precise in a way? I mean, the physics sounds different. I think that's the that's the big question. Yes, you. you uh, mm -hmm. I mean, and a, for a theorist, of course, a zero eating a pole is obvious, right? But experimentally, you cannot see zero. So, so this is a you you want another diagnostic of what the mechanism is. I think uh, this is Sasha Krikun, by the way. <laughs> I think uh, that in principle, if you have the mechanism of uh, zero eating pole, then the, the effect should be much more drastic. So it's because it, it's basically kinematics. When uh, they come close to each other, they immediately collide and uh, destroy each other. However, mm -hmm. if you have suppression due to anisotropy, it should look smooth. Well, in, uh, in that is if you can think of this as a continuous parameter in your experiment, right? Often, this is not a continuous parameter in your experiment. Well, if you're talking about anisotropy, then your angle is continuous parameter. However, if you have the zeros and poles colliding, then when you change the angle, you will suddenly hit the collision point. This my this is what I'm trying to express. But uh, I completely support uh, the statement that actually distinguishing these two is very is very non-trivial. That's precisely the reason why here on this slide you see two different papers where we were trying to isolate either one mechanism or another mechanism. So it's, uh, I don't know, I, uh, it's a convoluted study.
I think I, I, I think actually for the for the for the this work which Lee was uh, talking about, it would be quite interesting I think to study zeros in this particular model. Mm -hmm. Just once once you have because here we have a theoretical control on it, so we can I agree really figure out what happens. Mm -hmm. So if there is zero, then uh, it's one thing. If there is no zero, it's another thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, there's also this uh, Philip Phillips angle uh, to it, and I try to quickly reproduce it. Um, how was it? Kuwait, can you reproduce it quickly? Uh, so, so Philip has been running around with this for quite a long while, right? And basically saying, well, if a system is modernous, there should be zeros out there. And how was it? There are certain consequences attached to it, but I can't <coughs> reproduce it. Uh, I cannot reproduce it because I'm trying to uh, understand it. But Philip already yeah. for years has been saying that in modness you have a zero in the spectral function. Yeah. At the mod state, it's true, right? Precisely at at half filling, you have uh, you cannot have any spectral weight. There are no occupied states at the level. But the moment you dope it, um, then it becomes tricky and interesting. Yeah, uh, so, so my uh, trouble is really that, um, um, yeah, when you can make the statement that you have these absolute zeros, it all, all flies, but actually, um, are we sure that there are these absolute zeros? Also, when you have modulus or something, right? and then find a density, then it's also clear that you need to have these zeros. I think it's also what you were saying, Kuhan. Uh, so the existence of real zeros um, carries kind of physical information. Right, and, and when you have the zeros, they can collide with poles, right? And that, that, that is also carrying information. I wonder whether, in one or the other way, this can be further exploited to shed light on, 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 on uh, everything. Just try to recollect what. Yeah, I think that's a really, that's a really interesting oh, question. Yeah. But uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer at this moment. Yeah. Well, at least from theoretical point of view, again, the, the zeros of Philip Phillips, they arise when you introduce the power decoupling in the in the Dirac uh, action. That's in his holographic model, but yeah, yeah. has a bigger story just from the condensed matter point of view. Oh, yeah. That, no, then, of course. Uh, 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 okay, yes. From, from the bigger perspective, I mean, from the bigger perspective, if there are any zeros, then the zero pole collision mechanism should be working. Yeah. So it doesn't care where the zero is coming yeah. from. Yeah. But they need to have these zeros. And it's not said that in physical systems there are zeros. I don't quite see it. And holography is also, I don't think it's it's generic. Right? It's more something that happens in holography, I guess. Because well, the zero can also be uh, suppressed to zero as uh, yeah. Yeah, zero in the yeah. lower complex yeah. plane, which is, it, it will also work. In holography, you have this alternate condensation thing, right? And therefore, you know that 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 pending your conversation, uh, you have a pole or a zero, and therefore zero is what will exist. But is that true in general? I don't think so, because the alternate conversation thing is very typical of holography. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I think it may be interesting to test the zeros with a strong lattice effect. Maybe the zero point disappears, but the strong lattice cares. Just like the peak will suppress, and then maybe the zero also disappears. Uh, you would think so, right? It's... I, I have no idea, but uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it is one of the benefits of holography that you can actually trace these zeros very very meticulously. And if they're there, there ideally you have another diagnostic for the same effect. Very good. Thanks for the discussion. Anything to add? Other questions? <clears throat> okay, Lee, I don't see anybody else asking questions. Okay. So, okay, let's thank, let's thank Lily again. It was a very nice talk. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And just let me say that then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are getting some clapping. Next talk will be next Thursday at uh, 5 uh, p.m. Uh, 
uh, Central European time. It will be Luca de la Cretas. Uh, <coughs> and uh, you can find more info in the Holotube page that I just listed in the chat. So with that, uh, this is all for today. Thanks a lot to everyone. And thanks, Lee, especially for the okay, talk. Bye. Oh, thanks.